Yeah, I'm not used to using a podium. <laughs> We're used to home fellowships or open air meetings and uh, uh, groups of people that can be quite large sometimes, uh, including funerals. But I, I tend to pace around and just walk around and engage people more personally. And I'll be honest, I normally don't like standing up here. I like standing at the same level as the people that I'm speaking because I am not some special big person. I'm a little normal person serving a big God. And the things that God has done in our mission and in me and in the brethren that I walk with, uh, they're not unique, you know, to us that we're some special people. Uh, the truth is we're, we're just normal people. In fact, we're very flawed people that had to learn through a lot of trial and error uh, and through personal consecration and, and re repentance and seeking the Lord. It's creaky. I will step down. See, my wife, see, she's my better half. She gives me guidance. <laughs> so it, it really, uh, we had to go through a lot of trial and error to get to where we were. And I knew when I was going to Kenya that I was going to class. I was going to school. Uh, the call was clear. The direction was, you know, it, it, there, was, there was no doubting that he was sending us there. But there was also complete clarity that when he was sending us there, that uh, he would have to fill in the gap of what we were missing in order to prepare us to do the things that we needed to do, and that ultimately he was equipping us so that we can equip other people. Uh, something that God has given me a, a unique uh, opportunity to do is equip other people, other missionaries, other evangelists, other people who are operating in different gifts, uh, and uh, that's why I'm here. Uh, we're not even we're, we're we're not even visiting our own family. We're going out to eat once with them on this whole trip. We're just literally visiting you guys uh, throughout the country, and we had many many requests. We could have gone to thirty or forty locations, uh, but Cindy said we're not leaving the children for more than three weeks. <laughs> so the ten children and uh, are at home without us, and they're perfectly safe, and everything is great. And the mission goes on. I'm getting like ten mission uh, ten messages a day. We've baptized people every day since I've been gone, and God is moving. And the rains have arrived, praise the Lord, because it has been a very extended drought, and literally people are dying and animals are dying. In our region, it's only animals are dying, but other parts of the country, people are starving to death. It's really horrible. So, um, so we praise God for that, that those things are moving forward. Um, a little from my background, uh, you know, I, I did not come from a Christian home. And in fact, I came from pretty much the opposite of a Christian home. Uh, the example in my home wasn't a very good one. Come from a broken home. Uh, my parents were both flawed, and I don't want to disrespect them, but I just want to encourage you guys that God is willing and capable of using just about anybody, regardless of their background. And so I was into everything you can think of bad. And I, I you know, I don't know how you are in front of your children, but I'm transparent. I was into drugs, drinking, running around with women. I've been in jail. All those things happened in my youth. And when God finally intervened and uh, I, I'd say scared me into my senses, uh, at the same time, I met my wife. And we, we weren't husband and wife. And so we went to university together and we weren't married. And uh, but uh, but we were at least an anchor to escape the lifestyle of, you know, partying, which was my lifestyle. That's the only lifestyle I knew. Um, and God really intervened when we married because finally, you know, certain parts of my life that were not right were made right. And uh, he showed up at my wedding <laughs> pretty much. He was invited, uh, I, I don't know, unbeknownst to us. And we became Christians probably within like three or four months. And for me, the epiphany, what really, the light bulb that's, that, that, that just turned on was that the Bible is true. Can you believe? I grew up in an American culture. I, it, that concept never even crossed my mind, that the Bible is true. And uh, when somebody said that, I, it just hit me in my spirit. And I, I just knew that it was true. And I remember coming home, and, uh, and I dusted off my King James Bible from the shelf, and it, it had never been opened. And I dropped it on the table with a heavy thump. And I told Cindy, if this is true, we're going to live by it. 
And she just looked at me and eek. <laughs> and so, and both of us started attending uh, uh, an evangelical church. And, and they were good people, very good people. People took us under their wing. And we were there for a year until we moved to another town. And we consumed the word of God. Uh, my wife and I are both uh, gifted as far as students. <laughs> And so we consumed the Word of God. I was reading many books. I was in five Bible studies. And just in one year, when we went to the next church, they made us teachers, you know, uh, because of the rapid pace. We didn't have the maturity, um, but we certainly had knowledge. And in that church, they had small groups. And there were uh, these small groups that were meeting in different geographic locations. And in our geographic location, we had five couples that were all extremely mature. Uh, they were predominantly homeschooling families, very committed to serving the Lord, strong marriages, and to this day, they're just upstanding people. And we were this new young couple. I mean, we just had our first child, and, um, and they just set an exceptional example for us. And, um, and we learned that value of that close personal discipleship, that interaction. And from there, we moved to another town. And uh, when we moved to another town, we, we moved to another church because it was distant. And in that other church, we couldn't find a, uh, you know, a, a, what I would say, a Bible-believing church. You know, we had a difficult time finding a Bible-believing church. And we found a church. It was a Pentecostal church. And, you know, we met with the pastor. We talked to him. And, and the Lord just said yes. And so we went there. And they had some doctrines we weren't familiar with and some things. And I'm like, well, it's there. It's in the Bible. Uh, though I have zero experience with some of these things. And so, and now the way that they understood those things, I, I certainly don't agree with all those things today, that having experienced some of those things myself now. Uh, but uh, the openness of understanding that God was still active and doing things in the world is what I was exposed to in that environment. And then all of a sudden, my second son was born terminally ill. And uh, he was missing his left kidney, his spleen, his intestines were in his lung cavities, and his heart valves didn't work, so the blood wouldn't flow through the lungs. It just flowed through the umbilical cord only. And we were told he was going to die. And then something happened that changed my life. The Lord spoke to me and said, he is not going to die, but that he's going to be healed. And then, of course, all the surgeons, doctors, the entire staff, they're, they're like, this is a, not a good situation. I mean, they, 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 they told me directly that this was a terminal condition. And, uh, and I'm like, nope. No, it's not. You know, God said he's going to be healed. He's going to be healed. I told my wife, told my uh, pastor at the time. I told my sister-in-law, and I just, just cling to it. And they went in for surgery to move his, uh, his intestines from his lungs to, to where they belong. And I remember the doctor coming to... Uh, it's great. Cindy and I, they just finished the surgery. He walked out in his scrub still. He had to pull the mask off even. And he goes, I reached back with my pinky. He goes, I touched it. It's there. The kidney was there. And the spleen was there. And everything was there. And he was healed. He was completely healed. And he's 18 years old now. He's a full-time evangelist. Um, so that's when I realized God is not trapped between the covers of a leather-bound book. And that changed everything. And at the time, you know, I, I, I'm a geologist, geophysicist. I was doing environmental consulting. Uh, I worked for ExxonMobil, Shell. I had, you know, a big job. And with a big team of people, I was a project manager. I had engineers, scientists, other senior project managers under me. And I started leading everybody to Christ. And I had a Bible study in my office to the point that my boss was very uncomfortable and my job was threatened. And ultimately, she was fired. And ultimately, I took her job, you know, but uh, because she was, it was a spiritual attack. And I just wouldn't lay down. I just said, fine, if this is the way it's going to be, I quit. I'm out of here. Well, then, the, you know, the CEO and vice president of the company, they came from distant offices to meet me at 6 in the morning before everybody goes to work to meet me, meet me at a deli and said, if this is the way it is in that office, don't worry, give us two weeks. It's going to be changed. And then everything changed. And of course, uh, I worked in that environment until I just felt more burden for the Lord that I need to serve the Lord. You know, it was like 60 hour 
work week, and at the time we probably had four children, and I knew that I just need to serve the Lord. This stuff is just a distraction. And, uh, and I didn't care about money. I, so I actually just completely changed careers. And I started doing something completely different, but working for a Christian brother uh, in a totally different discipline, nothing to do with my education, took an enormous pay cut, but all of a sudden, he's an evangelist, I'm an evangelist, I'm like, we're just doing this, you know? And we're, we just can't help it. We're doing these huge consulting jobs, flying all over the country, and, um, and sharing Christ, you know? And we just continued doing that for a while, and after about a year, the Lord said, I want you to do this. And I started to, I, I could understand his voice. And, and, and you know, the, the only thing I've done right in my Christian walk is, number one, I believed. Number two, I obeyed. Those are the only two things that have set me apart from, I'd say, everybody else's. I believed and I obeyed. That quiet voice, I didn't say, was that him or was it me? I said, okay, Lord, I'm doing it. And, uh, and every time I've done that, he's honored it. And there, there's been no exception. And, and I have a litany of stories, and I'm not here just to testify, but, but I want to give you a little background <coughs> of how I got to Africa. Because uh, from there, uh, the Lord wanted me to write a book, so I literally quit my job that day. No safety net, no savings, no nothing. Cindy's like, eek, had five children, mortgage payment, and uh, the Lord provided for every step of the way. There was one time we had nothing to eat, and Cindy's like praying and crying out to God, and God said, uh, whatever you need, just ask, and I'll give it. She says, I need fruit. We have no fruit in the house. You know, and, and, uh, and so she prayed for that, and then all of a sudden somebody knocks on the door and gives her a bag of fruit, randomly, out of nowhere. Three days later, we're out of fruit again, so <laughs> she's crying again to the Lord. We have $13 in the checking account. That's all we had. We cut up all the credit cards because I'm like, I'm not relying on anything. And I told nobody that I, quit, that I left my job because I want no human being to support what I'm doing. And uh, he provided every step of the way. And when I tell you how much he provided every step of the way, literally we paid every bill. We never missed a bill. The money normally came the day that the bill was due. Uh, we managed to buy a brand new uh, van, well, brand new, 5,000-mile van. Uh, paid cash, and and uh, and everything else. Paid off our student loans during that period. Yeah, that was like twenty thousand dollars or something. Unemployed, you know, without ever asking a human being for money. And so that we really, when there was a need, I would go and pray, and that need was met within an hour. And it, the closeness to God was over the top. And we were so flawed in so many ways. We were not kingdom Christians. We were not Anabaptists following the Antonicene understanding of obedience to Christ. And all those things, we just had a commitment. We just wanted to please God. We wanted to obey him. Now, we had a commitment to obedience. We were fish out of water in that Pentecostal church. We were the only homeschoolers. We were the only ones that abandoned all television, media, everything. Only ones with mom at home taking care of the children. I mean, we were like a complete fish out of water in that church, but we just had a personal commitment. We didn't care. And we loved and fellowshiped with everybody, no problem. You know, but uh, I, I will admit that the pastor was very threatened by us uh, because our literal commitment wasn't how he lived. And so there was kind of like microscope was on him for, for things like that. But, but it wasn't our goal to make anybody else uncomfortable. We just wanted to obey. And any extra money we have, we, we just gave it away. Um, our, our philosophy was, what do we need it for? And, and so uh, from there, uh, I went back to work after we finished writing that book. And then, uh, and then but I told them, if I'm going to work for you guys again, I, I'm working from home. I'm not driving to the office anymore. And I said, okay. And then the Lord gave me a vision to move to Indiana. Uh, it was a vision. It was literally, literally a picture with, showing what part of Indiana to move. I said, hon, we're moving to Indiana. She says, okay. <laughs> so we moved to Indiana. We didn't know anybody, had nothing there, but I worked from home, so it was re really easy. And so we continued there for three years until uh, my job went away because of, uh, the, it was, the, I think, 2008 when the economy tanked. And, uh, and so they, their clientele was reduced and they couldn't sustain me. I was the highest paid employee in the company. So um, 
somebody called me, and I was maybe it was Facebook, and said, you know, could you come to? At the, by by then we had written several books, and so people said, can you come and teach about these things in your books in Kenya? And so I agreed. I said, I'm not working. Might as well just go. And um, and so when I went, it was very crystal clear. The Lord said, you're going to live here. You're going to die here. You're coming to Kenya. And at the same time, I call Cindy on the phone, not knowing the huge bills I was racking up. I had no idea. <laughs> but uh, and and Cindy said, we're moving to Kenya, aren't we? And I go, how do you know? She goes, I got the message, <laughs> you know. And uh, she got the same report. And, and that's happened numerous times. And Cindy is like the, the greatest gift that I've ever received. And I, I said it at the Indiana meeting. I said, if anybody here says I have the best wife on earth, I'm going to say, what are you doing with my wife? <laughs> so, because uh, she is truly the best. And I, I can't, and there's so many things I can say about her, and she will cringe because she's a powerhouse. That humble little exterior does not tell you what she is capable of. But praise the Lord for that, because she is, uh, she's my anchor. And uh, Kenya, uh, it took us three years to ramp up to sell everything and completely downsize and move to Africa with no support, by the way. We're, when I moved to Indiana, I didn't go to a church. I did what I do, evangelism. I was leading people to Christ, perfect strangers, and we had home fellowships, plural in our area because of people that I was leading to Christ. And uh, it's all I knew, <laughs> you know. And so uh, that was, I had no idea, but it was complete preparation for the mission field. I had no idea I, was, I would be some international missionary at some point. So when we moved to Kenya, we had nothing. We had no support. We were living on our own savings. Uh, I had a retirement account that was pretty big, and it took us about, I'd say two or three years to burn through that, and uh, every dollar we had, it, when we were in Indiana, at one point, we had three houses, and we just sold everything. I still have one house. Uh, they pay rent. That's how I feed my family. We don't ask for support, and, uh, and so we were completely self-funded, and our house church network, I was probably the wealthiest person in our house church, so we weren't getting a lot of support from the other members, and, uh, and so, but... After a few years, people started noticing what we were doing, and slowly we would start to get a donor for 25, 50, and whatever, and it started to go up, and then our money was gone, you know, and then it just worked. And, and, and since then, you know, we've, uh, our, our mission has been supported by a bunch of individuals, many we've never even met, many of you people here, you know, and Kenya was hard. Kenya was hard. When we got off the plane, it was torture. I mean, the people that were closest to us, they, every single one of them had ulterior motives. We were being robbed left and right. I mean, when I got off the plane, my bank account was emptied. And I had just sold my car. They drove us to the airport in the car. Somebody dropped it to the person buying it. And then the money got shipped ahead. By the time we made it there, the money was gone. And that was the first time. Second one, somebody helped us buy a car. We helped us buy that car. That was gone, taken away. You know, so it's like we lived without a car. We, we lived without electricity for six years. We have an outhouse, you know, doing laundry by hand, you know, with 10 children. And, uh, and, that's, and we didn't have the language, the culture. We had nothing going in. Uh, but the Lord sent us there. Nothing. I mean, the probability of us succeeding, it's impossible, except for the Lord was in it. You know, that's the only thing. It wasn't because of our incredible abilities, <laughs> because we had no idea about witchcraft and what it was like and what we were going to face when we got in Kenya. And we were attacked from every front. We've had death threats. We had, uh, count, I mean, just constant sickness. Uh, we've had people trying to take our property and all the time. And then we had brethren that, the, the ones that were closest to you were the ones who were betraying. You know, and it was one after the other. And we didn't realize until just last year that that was actually witchcraft. That somebody had placed something in the foundation of our house that made whoever got close to me hate me and betray me. And it happened one after another, including other Americans that worked with us. So it was nonstop 
slaughter. And during that time, before we made it to Kenya, we were, I'd say, kingdomized. We, uh, we discovered uh, the Antonicene writings through David Bursault's teachings. And we, we, it was a breath of fresh air. It wasn't like something radically new for us as much as it was finding communion, finding fellowship with a large segment of people that believe that what Jesus said was meant to be obeyed. And we were blown away. We're like, for hundreds of years, people obeyed Jesus. The things that it says here are actually true and meant to be followed. And so in our lifestyle, it wasn't that radical of a change because we were committed to some of those things already, you know, and, uh, but we weren't alone anymore and it was so exciting. Okay. But we were still kind of an independent entity. We were still pioneering the things that we were doing. You know, uh, we, we weren't affiliated with a larger group of people, uh, besides our own home fellowship, people that are strong brothers, you know, um, they're, they're the ones that organized the Indiana meeting. They're, they're really great brothers. And so, and so we're in Africa with this onslaught, and we're thoroughly kingdomized. So we're preaching non-accumulation, non-resistance. By the way, we do preach non-accumulation because not all modern kingdom Christians practice all the things that Jesus said. But the other things Jesus said, too, we were practicing, uh, which is go and make disciples of all nations. We're very evangelistic, and I just wouldn't, I, I never have been able to shut that down ever since my son was healed. I'm like, I got to tell everybody. I got to tell everybody because he's alive, he's active, he's still doing work, and he's speaking to those who are willing to listen. And, and that, that gives some people heartburn to hear that God still speaks. And guess what? He does, because I wouldn't be here today because he's the one that wanted me here. You know, so uh, the reality, though, is when we got to Kenya, and we started getting slammed, is my heart started to grow sour. I was having a difficult time loving the very people that were betraying me left and right. And after three years, uh, I never never gave up because I knew I'm going to live here, I'm going to die here. That's all. They're going to bury me in African soil. And that's a fact. There's no getting around that. Okay, but I'm not liking where things are at. I'm not liking it at all. But I kept persevering and I kept being persistent. Slowly, slowly teaching people, you know, practicing church discipline in a proper way, encouraging people in a right way. Uh, but I was not freely loving people. It was very difficult to love them. And even if I, you know, put on a good show, being nice and everything like that, my heart is like, yeah, I love you, but I really don't trust you, you know. And, uh, and so it was on our fifth year that uh, we had moved on to Uganda. Now, our Uganda move wasn't all pure in the sense that it wasn't just that we wanted to start something new. The truth is Kenya had some, some unhealthy things going on that we really didn't even want to be around at this point. So, uh, but the other thing is our work permit. We were told our work permit cannot be renewed in Kenya. So we had to have an alternative. So we started the Uganda mission. And so when we were in Uganda, <clears throat> we knew we couldn't just release the other ministry because they didn't have quality leadership yet. They, they still had, they were great in front of us, but they had infighting amongst each other, each other. And that's the thing I really didn't want to be around because ultimately it was me. And uh, the only one that every single person respects is me. And at that point, we didn't have any of the people coming against me, but they were against each other still. And there was still jealousy, and there was still a lot of witchcraft. We didn't know that. We didn't know who we were fighting. We're thinking we're having problems with people. And it wasn't people all along. All the people that have betrayed me, it wasn't them. There's a reason why Jesus can go to the cross and say, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, because you know they knew what they were doing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But love assumes the best. They didn't know what they were doing. Love maintains no record of wrong. Forgive them. Are you understanding? That's love. And Stephen did the same thing. And loving, being kind and gentle, and those things we can understand. That kind of love is, is everywhere. You know what I'm saying? Because that's socially acceptable love. But kingdom love is a few steps behind. You know? You literally have to maintain no record of wrong. 
You have to forgive people. You have to be open. You can't maintain any bitterness and, and, uh, and those challenges with people. You really have to be free completely. And you have to assume the best. You have to assume they don't know what they're doing. Because if they're doing something wrong and they're Christian, they really don't know what they're doing. If you understand who Christ is, you can't just wrong someone else. Because you have absolutely no understanding of the fear of God. You have no understanding of who really is, he, he really is and what he's done for you. If you can just freely be gossiping about one of your own people, you know, or having har harboring resentment and bitterness in your heart about somebody else, you know, bickering, strife, all those things. It says people who practice these things won't inherit the kingdom of God. The greatest one being factions, factions. We call that denominations today. And it says, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I warn you as I forewarned you that it's not going to happen. And, uh, and so when I came back from Kenya, I mean Uganda into Kenya, uh, I saw a mess. It was a big mess. And, and so I'm like, all right, I know what to do. I just need to fast and pray. Lord's got to tell me what to do here because I have no idea what to do. So I know exactly what to do. I have no idea what to do. <laughs> you know, I need to get... I need to get an answer from the Lord. He's got to tell me what to do here because I have no idea what to do. So I'm in a perfect place, really. There's no better place to be is when you have no other options except for relying on God because that's really what he wants. You understand? Every miracle has one thing in common, a need that couldn't be met other than through God. That's the only way you're going to get a miracle. So, so what happens is when I get back and, and we start praying, at the same time there starts... Some, a group of people that are spiritual, I start all my prayer meetings. And at these all night prayer meetings, things start to happen. Little radical things, like people getting healed, casting out demons, uh, you know. And they're really praying, praying, praying. And we start to get a lot more prophetic words. Now, all along, we have people that operate in prophecy and, and different gifts. So I'm not going to say it's just like everything started in one day, but in me, everything started in one day. Because when I started fasting, I made it like 11 days. And during that period, God showed me things in myself that I didn't know I needed to deal with, like this, this inability to love the very people I was sent to minister to. And this is five years into the mission. Many churches, many disciples, but I will say a lot of fakes among us. You understand? Because there was a part of me that was still fake. You understand? Not intentionally. All good intentions. Nothing negative in the intentions. Well, during that time, as an escape from some of the realities, we picked up something that we abandoned a long time ago. We started watching movies. Nothing that the world would consider bad or anything like that, but, but just fantasy stuff. And just a little thing. And then... Another thing that plagued me and followed me my entire life, I told you I didn't come from a very good home. Pornography was just in our house. When we were, I was five years old, they were watching those movies in front of me. You know, so I have images in my head that from us when I was five years old. You, you can't forget them. You, you just can't let them go. And so when I became a Christian, of course, I had nothing to do with any of those things ever again. But still, this imagery is still there. It's still there. So when I'm in this fast, I'm realizing. I, at the time, I really didn't know what was going on. But I knew there was something in me that needed to go. Okay? And I just prayed, Lord, if there's something in me, get rid of it. Right now, in Jesus' name, boom. My, my heart was warm. And I loved the people I was around immediately. I could not conjure up one of those images again. Couldn't even conjure them up. They are just gone immediately. You know, and then, and then we had a big old heap of stuff that we, bur we burned that day. All movies and books and anything with anything even suspicious or the idea that it might be suspicious. You know, we just got rid of everything. And something happened. From that day forward, when I prayed for people, people got healed. When I prayed for people to receive the Holy Spirit, people just were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues. Demons started to manifest. Sometimes just me walking in the room, demons would manifest, and I would cast them out. And that was a change. It was a big, big change. And the change started inside of me. 
But there was something there that I never knew existed. The word deliverance, we can say it all the time. But some things, what do I say? Theologically, we can't accept. And at the time, I didn't understand exactly what was going on. Now I do understand exactly what is going on because the Lord opened up some gifts. At the time, we weren't operating in gifts. We were just operating by the authority of the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, we operate by gifts that we did not know existed. They do exist. And uh, I'm going to share with you what's really going on because there's stuff really going on behind the scenes that uh, most Christianity, we, we just don't know what's there. So with all good intentions, we believe that we need to obey Jesus, follow him, do, do good, don't do bad, you know, all those things. Those things are all great, you know, and I believe that's why God was patient. Because by the time he opened up Pandora's box, and we started to see what was going on spiritually. I had a large group of people that were committed to obedience to Jesus, but doing it in a very... Uh, doing the best they can, but not very good at it. You, you know what I'm saying? Which I believe is probably most people, because that's where I was. Okay? The commitment's there, but we're not quite there. What I read in the book of Acts is nothing like what I see. And so there's this cognitive dissonance, and so we have to formulate theology to justify why my Christian experience is not the same as the early Christian experience. And there's whole groups of people, you know, when I say the kingdom community, people who espouse the teachings of the Antonicene writings, you know, people who follow David Verso and his teachings, which are spectacular, by the way, they still don't walk in anything from that period. And they formulate theology that those things stopped in the Bible and then they didn't continue into that period, which is a blatant lie. People were being raised from the dead, being healed, casting out demons. There is more written about demons in that Antonicene period than there is anywhere. And they kept doing deliverance. And they kept healing people. And they kept seeing all the things that you find in the book of Acts. And we act like, oh no, those things ended with the apostles. Or they ended with the formulation of the canon. And uh, it's a lie. And the reason why that lie is there is because I was just talking uh, to, to a couple brothers last night and how the enemy has many tools, weapons in his arsenal. And he's going to use every single one of them on you. And, and I'm going to explain what a lot of those things are because you don't even know what you're fighting. And if you understand what you're fighting, it's very easy to fight back. Very, very easy, because all power and all authority has been vested in Christ, and you are his hands and feet. We are the body of Christ, okay? So, And he said that we will trample on the serpents and scorpions and all the powers of the enemy, and none of them can harm us. And so there is authority and power vested in you as the body of Christ that you don't know exists, because there's theology that tells us that those things are not for today. And the only reason that theology is there is because it justifies their experience or lack of experience of those things. Because if I am a good Christian and I obey and I do the right things and I follow Christ and I don't see these things, then there must be something wrong with the other people. Because the people who do do these things, the Benny Hens and Todd Whites, or you name all these different names, they have compromised theology or crazy hair. You know, so they're doing things that I'm not. But I believe right. And so I can't reconcile that. There must be something wrong with them. Because there's nothing wrong with me. There's no way it can be something wrong with me. Well, I had to repent, me. And I came out of the closet, <laughs> you know, about two years ago, January, is when I was in that fasting. The Lord showed me, you've been trying to do it on your own. You have been neglecting the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. You are not where you once were. There was a time when I used to guide and lead you and tell you what to do, and you did it that day. And you didn't question it. You didn't doubt it. You just did it. And now you are doing everything because of what is written in a book. You're just following what's written. And you're not listening to me anymore. By the way, what he tells you to do is not going to be contrary to the book. He's not going to tell you to divorce your wife and marry another woman. No, that's forbidden. Okay. But what he will tell you to do is, I want you to, just like when all the brothers were praying and they set aside Paul and they set aside Silas or Barnabas and they said, go. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's what it was. They were being led by the Holy Spirit. 
They were being guided when he wanted to go to Asia. And the spirit of Jesus said, no. And they were blocked. Then all of a sudden he had a dream and said, go. Where did he go? Asia. (laughs) You know, but he was told, he was guided, he was led. That's what the Lord wants to do with us today. But we don't believe it's possible. So we go to the pages of a book. And we worship a book. Many people worship a book. It's idolatry. Jesus is the living word. That book is to reveal the living word. If you want to know his nature, you want to know everything about him, you want to know everything about God and his will for your life, it's right there. But it's not going to say marry her or don't marry her, go to college or don't, take this job or don't take this job, become a missionary to Kenya or don't. It's not in that book. The general revelation is there. The specific revelation is the Holy Spirit living in you who wants to speak, but we say he can't, therefore we squash his voice. And by the way, you're going to learn from me. I can stand up here for eight hours. I don't script what I'm going to say. I have no idea what I'm going to say before I stand up. And that's why he's like, do I record? You know, Mike said, do I record one meeting and then share it? I'm like, there are going to be nine different meetings. (laughs) And there's probably going to be very little overlap of content. (coughs) But the point is, uh, when I repented of those things, God opened it up. He opened it up. He brought me back to where I was and 10 steps beyond. But it wasn't over. It wasn't over because at that point, I started seeing some of the things that are recorded in Scripture. And I'm going to demonstrate biblically. We're going to read the verses. I'm going to go through all the different things about healing and deliverance and so that you can understand that it's not just my ideas. Okay, but there are some things that aren't written. They're not written. It doesn't say exactly how. You know, it just says that they did. It doesn't say what they did. So it doesn't explain to you what the gift of discerning of spirits mean. What is the gift of knowledge? Nobody knows what it means. And if you're just talking about it, if you experience it, you can come and say, oh, this is exactly what it is. I know, you know, and and so, but most people don't experience it because they don't believe it's for today, really. And they'll say that, yeah, the gift of evangelism, I can understand. I can accept it. Uh, Teaching, yep. You know, oh, to be a pastor is okay, but don't talk about apostles. You know, those things we can't accept today. So we'll make up new words. We'll call them missionaries, which comes from the Latin word materi, which means to be sent, which is what apostolos means in Greek. (laughs) You understand? So we'll just coin new words. Uh, You know, and so then we can justify that there are no more apostles because now we have missionaries, which is what the word apostle means. (laughs) You know? And so uh, when we started to do those things, we immediately continued with all-night prayer meetings every single week. One day a week, we'd have 30 or 40 people praying all night. And demons started to manifest left and right, some of them in our people. And I'm like, demons, our people, what's going on here? <laughs> we don't know what's going on here. And we really didn't know what was going on. And, and it took a long time to figure out what's going on. And so, because we would free somebody. And then three weeks later that same person would manifest again with the, with the same demon. And, and these demons would talk. I mean, it would be the same one. It's like it would be named Frank, Joe, or Harry. I mean, you know it's the same demon. And uh, they do lie, but you can tell by certain behaviors that it's the same one. But uh, And so we, we really didn't know what to do with that because there's nothing out there that talks about a demon could, could demonize a Christian. I mean, and these people are not just believe in Jesus, raise your hand, Christians. We are teaching people to surrender, to count the cost that, you know, that you must obey, you must repent. And we're going through a serious process, which I'm going to share, because most people don't know how to share the message of the kingdom of God. You can say you're a kingdom Christian, but I bet you there's probably only a few people in this room could articulate what the kingdom actually is. You know what I'm saying? They can say, oh, you want to know the kingdom of God, read the Sermon on the Mount. And so, go evangelizing, you read the Sermon on the Mount. You're like, okay, what do I do with this now? I need to obey all these things and I'm in the kingdom? You know, so, people don't know how to articulate. Uh, Because of my background, being a project manager, was servicing huge accounts for major oil companies, having huge teams, having so many different things to do all the time, I've learned how to take very, very complex things and simplify it you know, so that I can train somebody else to be able to do the things that I do because there's no way I can do all the work myself. 
And so everything that the Lord has done in me and shown me, at first, I just walked around with the Bible. And I'm reading these passages, and I'm teaching them a certain way. Well, how am I going to get this Kenyan guy who doesn't even understand my English to do it? Well, I need to have those verses printed out, you know, and organized in a way that they can, because they don't know the Bible. Like, I, 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 have, a, I have a good memory. <laughs> I keep the Bible here. But, uh, and so I'm able to just know what to read and when. You tell me you got a problem with marriage, I know where all the verses are. You tell me you got to... So, but I'm teaching these guys, half of them, they've never been to school. You know, they can read, but they can't remember things. And so I have these little pamphlets that I use. That the first one is the kingdom of God. The second one is surrendering, repenting, and being baptized. The third one is the commands of Jesus Christ. The fourth one is what does the Bible say about church? And so people go through a very foundational teaching. By the way, all these things are available on our website, kingdomdriven.org. There is a postcard back there. Everybody here should grab one. Okay, If you actually want to do this work, then you should probably get those books, but you don't have to buy them. Uh, I will email any of those books to people freely. Okay, You're paying for the books because I had to pay to print them, not because I make any profit on them. Okay. So anybody who want, likes to read on a Kindle, I can email those books to you anytime. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on WhatsApp. Okay, But don't call me by phone <laughs> because I'm very, very busy. I will not take phone calls. But uh, anyway, uh, we have a systematic approach that works, that is multi-generational. So now I have evangelists and teachers that are going out doing the work perfectly flawlessly. So we started praying and we had a foundation of people that had good teachings, but that were not walking by the power of the leading of the Holy Spirit. Lots of them. We started doing these prayer meetings. We started gathering people in groups. We started praying for people. And honestly, people were delivered and people were filled with the Holy Spirit again and again and again. And this story is written in that book, Christianity Unleashed, which I can email to you if you don't want to drop five bucks. But, uh, in fact, I encourage people to take the email because we're going to run out of those. <laughs> so so uh, after about a year, our, our, our mission is and growing. This is just last year. This is not like a long time ago. This is recent. This is now. I mean, we're here now for reason. We didn't delay. We had something to share, <laughs> you know. Um, and so about a year ago, there was... Uh, a few women, they were very powerful intercessors, gifted women that said, we really need more of the men to come up. We have these super powerful intercessory women that work in the prophetic, and they're like, uh, we don't like being the women with these gifts, and we don't have any men that are that, that have these same gifts. It's uncomfortable, you know? And so what they wanted is, let's get a fasting and prayer meeting together with key leaders that we know God has called for leadership, and let's see them boosted. Okay? Uh, at the same time, we were doing deliverance in a way that was not recommended at the time. It was just based on um, all that we had. We didn't have the gifts, so we couldn't see what was going on. So we would actually, the de demons talk. They're willing to talk. So, uh, and we would get information from them. But they're, they're a bunch of liars, and really the Lord convicted us after that. He didn't like you talking to them. It's it, not to get information. They're not on our side. Why would you ask the enemy how to get rid of the enemy? <clears throat> so, so uh, that's why God gives gifts. The Holy Spirit wants to be the one to guide you in those processes. He doesn't want you to rely on the bad guy. You know, so, so what happened, uh, we were praying for people in the old way, but we didn't realize it, but it was the Holy Spirit giving us the information. And he had activated something. And, and so, but we hadn't realized it yet. Uh, and so what happened is we started praying for somebody, and we would realize that even if they're not in the room, we could get the information. I'm like, whoa, they're not even in front of you? And you get the information. And it's spot on. I mean, 100% accurate. And, and then we realized that we can actually... We can identify people's spiritual gifts. We can see them. It's like, whoa, never heard about that before. You know, and then uh, at the same time, 
when we had the meeting deciding that we needed to pray, somebody said something that made my memory, recollected my memory of, a, of an event that happened a year ago. Uh, a very trusted, stable, awesome brother once said to me that the Lord showed him that he couldn't not to share everything with me because, I forget the words, but it was kind of like I, I would tell people that I shouldn't. Either either gossip or move too fast to solve the problem. Like I know somebody has a problem and I'm like, I'm going in. You know, because I'm not one that tiptoes or waits. We, uh, we solve problems, you know. So, and, 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 and the, one of the women mentioned something like that, that God's not going to give you some of the revelatory gifts if you cannot handle them properly. But two prophets had said like several months later that God was going to give me, in their, in their eyes, in their broken Swahili, a picture. You'll be able to look at somebody and see. You know, like Jesus, he can look at a man and know what's in his heart. And, uh, and, he's, and, and, and one of the prophets had said, it's good, but it's bad. Because some things you don't want to see. You know, because Jesus saw everything that was in Judas, but he still didn't do anything with it. He knew not to do anything with it. And so it was, uh, it was something that when, uh, when I heard that, I'm like, good, finally we can solve these problems with witchcraft and the people doing all these. We can finally get to the bottom of some of these recurring challenges that we have in our fellowship. And so, or in our fellowships, we have many churches. And, and so, uh, but it didn't come. And then when that woman said that, and I'm like, oh, now I know why. I know why. The problem is me. The problem is me. I'm not ready. I, I'm not ready. I don't, I don't have the maturity. I, I can't handle understanding the secrets of the people around me because I, I, I won't handle it properly. And so I repented of that immediately. Then we had an all-night prayer meeting that Friday. It was two days later. And I just, the Holy Spirit started speaking more and showed me little things that mistakes I was making, like five or six of them. I can't tell you what they are. I remember one was not greeting people. In Kenya, you got to greet everybody. And here I would have had to greet every single one of you if I was in Kenya. It's not our culture, <laughs> you know. But in Kenya, it's insulting if you don't do that, you know. And so that's a mistake on my part. The other one was something about Facebook or the Internet or, or maybe watching the news, you know. And, and so all those things, I just, phew, I just said, Lord, forgive me. I had no idea that these little things were hindering your power and presence in my life. Little tiny things. Cindy was convicted. You know, she had to get rid of coffee. It's not a sin. It's not a bad thing. But it was a level of personal consecration that was hindering her from the full activation of the gifts that God had for her. And it was the same thing for me. Okay? When I got rid of all those things, it was immediate. 3.30 a.m., and this is something I almost don't even want to share. People think I'm crazy. But at 3.30 a.m. that morning, we all slept in the same place where we were fasting. In Kenya, they can't just fast and say they're not eating. They have to be locked in a room where there's no food <laughs> in order to fast. I'm not kidding. So they don't believe you if you're going to sleep in your own bed that you're fasting. Because they know they wouldn't. <laughs> For the same reason, they know that I'm robbing from the ministry because they know if they had access to the money I did, they would. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So of course I am. <laughs> but so some things are funny culturally like that. But yeah, so we're locked in a room. When we had a seven-day fast, we're locked in a room with a cement floor. Seven days, locked. That's fasting. <laughs> so, I mean, not even water for the first three days. So, but... Uh, Kenyans know how to pray. Kenyans have faith, okay? But Kenyans have, they're exceptionally flawed in many other ways, you know? But if you start with that foundation and build on that, you can work out all the kinks. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, but it takes a lot of patience. So what happened is things started to activate with me. And, and uh, uh, crazy things, big things that, that I won't go into the detail. And at the same time, they were activating with my wife, who was at home. And then all of a sudden, the things that were prophesied, they, they, all, they all came to be. And, and uh, 
And since then, we've been praying for everybody. Now we can, we can identify. We can see witchcraft. We can see curses. We can see generational curses. We can see demons. We can see spirits. We can understand principalities. We can travel through areas and understand who the principalities are in each area we travel in. We learned how to pray for those things. Because when you can see them, and then you expel them, you know what they respond to. So by understanding what is there, you can see angels too. Uh, by understanding what is there, you learn how to approach it in order to deal with that. So you learn what you would need to do even if you couldn't see. Are, 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 you, are you understanding what I'm saying? So by having the privilege of seeing, you know exactly what you need to do to get rid of the thing that is there that you can see. But you know how they respond to what you're doing. So that you can tell somebody who can't see exactly what to do to get rid of them if they couldn't see. Okay, we're here going out on a limb, sharing things that mo many people won't say are real or true. They'll say we're crazy. I'm telling you, it all works. It all works. Everything we're going to say is exactly true. Whether you believe me or not, I don't care, really. If you want to go further, the Holy Spirit's going to resonate with you. And he's going to tell you that, yep, that's exactly how it is. It's exactly how it works. And Cindy and I, since that day, we've seen I don't know how many people, thousands of people delivered, thousands of people healed, because we understand the nuances of how it works, okay? And so, and, and the things that we're going to share, they're not written in books. We don't know anyone else that, that does it in this way, you understand? But we've done it consistently, and it's been extremely effective, okay? And it has revolutionized our mission. It gave us the upper hand. Now we have weapons. The bad guys don't. We have the authority over them already. So we're already overcomers. We already have everything. But since we couldn't see them, number one, you don't fight who you can't see. You don't even know they're there. So you don't even know there's a war going on. And then if you have a theological construct that doesn't permit you to even fight, because those gifts aren't for today, what you're saying is the enemy has every single weapon at their disposal and they are going to unleash fury on you. And you are expected to fight back with your hands tied with no weapons. Let me just say, you're going to fail. We were on a trajectory for absolute failure in Kenya and there is nothing, there is nothing that would have changed that. If God did not intervene when I repented of not letting him lead, we would have failed miserably. But let me tell you the results of me repenting. Guys, I am not the only one gifted. Our mission, all the people are doing it. Because I am not a big person. You know, I'm an introvert. You don't even know that. You can't even tell I don't like being in front of people. I don't like attention. I don't like, okay, but I have to preach every funeral. Six, eight hundred, nine hundred people. I, you know, I have to do meetings like this. I'm constantly up front doing evangelism and training people. But my preference is actually one-on-one -on -one discipleship. I like equipping people. I like training people. I like other people to do what I do even better than I do. Because I don't want any attention on me. Because I'm not special. I'm not anything special. Okay? I am somebody who has simply surrendered. That's, that's all I've done right. I believe and I obey. That's it. Okay? Everyone here, I'm sure, claims to believe. Okay? And everyone here obeys what they have been trained to obey, but they stop short of all of it. Okay? Because, you know, uh, all the bearded ones and covered ones, every one of you will agree with non-resistance. You want to learn non-resistance? Move to Africa where the people that you're blessing by day are witching you by night are the same people that you're there to help rob you, okay, or threaten you. You want to learn non-resistance? Because the same people that are our neighbors are sending witchcraft to kill our children. You understand? And we still greet them. We still assist them. Because we see. We can see what they're doing. We know what they're doing. We get warnings before they do what they're doing. We stop it. We block it. We get rid of it. And then we just greet them still when they come to our sitting room and sit it. You know, 
And so that's exactly what Jesus did with Judas. He knew everything that was going on in him. You want to learn non-resistance? That's real non-resistance. Okay? There's a whole other level. Okay, non-accumulation. Guys, where I live, if you're lucky enough to have a job, you make a dollar or two a day. That's it. And people have to make a decision. Am I going to eat today or am I going to give malaria medicine to my child so they don't die? And you guys can go to Starbucks and drop five bucks on a coffee. Are you getting me? You can get new wheels and bigger tires for your pickup truck. You can do anything like that, and you don't realize that a dollar can save somebody's life. I live among the poor, the destitute poor. I see people die all the time. In our small village, they bury at least five people a week. You know, And death is a very, very normal. That's one thing I never really prepared for when I moved to Africa, burying my own people. My, I have had dead bodies in my van many times, carrying them to go bury them, okay? And these are people that I'm close with. And you don't realize that. And you don't realize, uh, you know, uh, our, our brother who loves us took us out to a uh, Chinese buffet. You want to talk about shock? <laughs> Take a couple people who have lived in Africa for seven years to a Chinese buffet. We're like... It's just shocking. And I, I even wrote on Facebook, it's like a picture of American overindulgence. You know, by the way, I loved it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I miss Chinese buffet. But it's a whole different experience to live among people who have nothing. Nothing. We have disciples that live in a house probably about this big, this little square. If you walk into their house, they have two jerry cans, little plastic jugs that they carry water with, three rocks, that's their kitchen. Okay, they cook on that. One souferia, which is a little pot, aluminum, thin pot, and a bench about three feet long. In the other room, there's a mat on the floor. That's their bedroom. It's cut in half. That's the bedroom. And a sheet for a door because they don't have a door. And it's made out of mud, and the floor is made out of manure. Okay? These are people I baptized. That's how they live. That's how they live on a normal basis. You know? And... I'm just looking around, <laughs> you know, I know, I know because I live there. I know you don't know. And what disturbs me the most is Africans who are wealthy. They don't help the other people. They don't. They're, they have a big, big problem because you don't know what's going on over there. So for you to go to Starbucks and drop five bucks, it's not a big deal. Okay. But for those guys, they know that people are starving. They're dying. They're, you know, all those different challenges. So. So we do what we can to help as many people as we can, but the need is way beyond what we could ever do. It is just impossibly beyond. But they manage. And so that's why they have faith, and we don't. You understand? Because you don't need faith. You can go to the pharmacist. You can go to the doctors. They have to pray. If, if not for healing, it's death. You know, And so they rely on that. And, and I can tell you stories. I mean, Cindy and I, we, we, uh, we have a prayer meeting. You know, every, it's now every other Saturday. People come from great distances because they heard there's a Mazungu who prays for free. Okay? And Mazungu means a white man. Okay, European, you know? And, uh, and people come. They get healed. They get healed. They can't afford to go to the doctors. That's the best thing they got going, but they get healed because if they don't have faith, they're, they're not going to get healed. Okay, so when everything got activated, we started to be able to clean up our mission. And God gave some powerful prophecies to really hammer some of the people that needed to change. Some people, they were just condemned. They were gone. And other people, we had people within our fellowship that were practicing witchcraft. And they repented. And it cleaned house in our church immediately. And the level of unity, love, common commitment, surrender. We are not a church. We are a mission. We are a mission. There is not anybody in our fellowship that is not committed to expanding the kingdom of God and loving and assisting other people. It's just the DNA of what we have. And I had the privilege of starting it from scratch. I didn't have any baggage, any... There were no rules. It's like, here's the word of God, follow his lead. That's it. And that's a privilege, but it's also quite difficult. 
Our first year, we had one disciple. Our second year, we had about five. Our third year, we had eight churches. You know, it went up exponentially like that. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people now, many churches. Okay, these are home fellowships. They're not big churches like this. They're home fellowships. You know, so they range in anywhere from 15 to some of them like 40 people. And so you must go, I'm going to teach this. You must go slow to go fast. You must go very, very slow. There's a reason why Jesus only invested in 12. He knew he would turn the entire world upside down with those 11 men that would remain. He knew to invest heavily and completely in the few to reach the multitude is the way you're going to do it through exponential growth. It's multi-level marketing at its best. That's what it is. The kingdom of God is multi-level marketing at its best, and it's free. It's free, but it costs you everything. You know, it's the best way to describe it. Because when I, when I decided to follow Christ, I didn't know it would cost this much. I didn't know all the sacrifices I needed. My entire career, my education, the comforts of home, my beautiful, you know, 10-acre property with a long, you know, quarter-mile driveway with, you know, beautiful log home. And that's what I had in Indiana. You know, privacy, a big river through the property. It's everything I would have ever dreamed of if I was a citizen of this world. But I'm not. So now I don't own anything in Kenya, technically. I'm not a citizen. I only can lease property. So I have nothing. And it's wonderful because I have a lot waiting for me, you know. Uh, so I am going to teach. Uh, I'm going to teach some of the foundational things. I, I want you to understand how to present the kingdom of God. My, my only limitation is going to be time. But I wanted to give a little background just so uh, you can understand where I'm coming from. Because uh, I have, uh, it's up to you whether or not you want to do anything with this. Because I'm going to go back to Kenya and continue doing what I'm doing. You're going to continue reading my Facebook posts, seeing that things are going great. Everybody wants what we have, but very few people want to do what we did to get there. You know, And so we are living out the book of Acts. We're baptizing people daily. It's every day. We, we add at least you know, an average 5 to 10 or 15 people per week. That's a normal week. We do deliverances daily. We see people healed daily. It's just normal experience. We have at least 8 to 12 evangelists going out every single day two by two. It's non-stop. We have prayer meetings and fasting meetings all the time. All the time. In fact, there's a prayer meeting right now. There's about 20, 24 people praying right now for this meeting. Dropped everything. Life, stop, need to pray. There's a meeting going on somewhere in Michigan. They can't pronounce Michigan. Michigan, and I is an E. No, Michigan, Michigan, something like that. Okay, so it's it's warped, but God knows. <laughs> but uh, they're praying right now. We had like all night prayer meetings. All the this message by missionary Mark Carrier was recorded at Agape Christian Fellowship in Michigan in 2019. To learn more about his ministry, please go to Kingdom Driven. Dot org, or to hear more messages given at the same conference, please go to www.livethebible.info.